Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending September 29th. I'm going to talk a little bit about physics, outer space, and astronomy today. I'm going to first talk about physics. I'm going to flip all the cards over and I'm going to admit, just like Stephen Hawking had to pay off the bet, I'm going to admit defeat. The Higgs boson obviously does exist as of July. The last report I was able to get a hold of, they had a sigma probability of 99.999. That's a 5 sigma, which is considered discovery level. When they reach 7 sigma, which they may have by now, I haven't gotten the latest updates, that's certainty to, what, uh, 2 in 10 billion, something like that. So I'm going to declare that the Higgs boson really does exist. However, I do have one little area where I may actually have a win that was where I was talking about in the past when I talked about physics on the TDD report, the fact that I believe that dark matter is mostly, if not entirely, made up of baryonic particles. That means everyday type of particles, protons, neutrons, what the regular stuff matter is made out of. Well, we have just got an article here at NASA.gov that they used the Chandra um, X-ray telescope and they have discovered that there is a halo around the Milky Way galaxy that may can't contain as much baryonic matter in the form of high energy, high temperature particles as the entire matter, the, as the entire mass of the Milky Way itself. So that would pretty much double if you're, you know, that would be saying that the system consisting of the Milky Way and the halo is twice the mass that it was previously and because it is spread out so far and so densely is the reason why as they were observing other galaxies they have not been able to detect this but evidently through using the facilities of the Chandra telescope um, they were able to actually determine that this is actually an effect they're still not calculating exactly they're still not able to calculate exactly how much is there but this is just an approximation but I'm saying even if they're off by a factor of 10 and it adds 10 percent to the matter I think last time when I talked about that they had discovered they're off with their predictions of the number of red dwarf stars that they had to increase the actual amount once they were able to determine by observation or some type of experimentation that there was actually more red dwarf stars that added to this mysterious dark matter and I think as the things continue on I may actually get a win in this category so I'm going about 50-50 so far in physics for maybe being ahead of the curve and able to guess things that's a batting average of about 500 I'd say probably pretty good for me having nothing more than just a very basic course in physics and just being interested in physics itself this one is I'll, like like usual I will post all the links but this one's uh, nasa.gov mission pages Chandra so check out the links below to all of the different articles. It's uh, been a while since I've had an update on the Curiosity rover. What is happening right now is the Curiosity rover itself is actually down inside a, a dry stream bed. And if you take a look at the pictures here, I'll put a quick, um, I'll put the pictures up here uh, so you can take a look at them too. It looks almost identical to an Earth dry stream bed. You've got the rounded rocks the pebbles, um, you've got some of the pebbles cemented into sediment just exactly the same way and evidently people that are experts in streams can determine by looking at this um, dry bed what, when the river was flowing exactly what was going on and they estimate the water was flowing at about three feet per second and the depth was somewhere between ankle and hip deep I don't know, really know what they used to determine that because I'm no expert in streams myself but just basically looking at these pictures too I can't really figure out any other way other than this being an actual water stream that existed and tumbled these rocks to smooth them out so I think the next thing we might look for is maybe some type of small visual evidence of life I mean wouldn't it be great to see like some small type of uh, shelled creature or something like that if that's possible um, I still think that it's pretty much probable that we're going to find very simple um, organisms on Mars, such as uh, ones that could hitch a ride on a meteor that maybe resulted from an impact on Earth that actually took some rock from Earth and distributed it to Mars. I think it's very likely that we're going to find bacteria, maybe fungi, something like that, simple organisms on that. That does not confirm life on Mars other than being transported from Earth, but then if you get into any kind of a larger um, creature, I think that pretty much is going to give us new things to think about, new things to explore on Mars. And that wouldn't that be great if if something like that did end up uh, turning up in the exploration? Right now, 
it's still in the Gale Crater and let's see here what is the name of the mountain there I was gonna try to find the name of the mountain they changed the name of the mountain here oh well anyway you can read the article and check out a little bit more of it the article on this one for the uh, Curiosity Rover is a very interesting read next this is up from now we're gonna leave astronomy space physics and outer space and we're going to get back down to earth again this was sent to me by Hank Two Wheels deal to turn whiskey leftovers into biofuel for cars and this is kind of interesting too because I think we've been really going through some tough decisions that we're going to need to be making in the future in America with using ethanol the fact that ethanol does not have as much energy as gasoline it only has about two-thirds the energy of gasoline so you don't get as good a gas mileage it's very disruptive from for certain types of fuel lines and stuff like that it tends to eat away in them well in this um, article here on bbc.co.uk they're talking about making butanol instead and the nice thing about butanol is that they're going to use first they're going to use whiskey leftovers to make it so they're not going to be taking up edible corn crops to make it they're going to be taking leftovers from another process and butanol also has about 92 percent of the energy of gasoline uh, if you go to a station that has 85% uh, blend ethanol, you have to have a specially modified vehicle to be able to run that. You can't just do that in ordinary. You could take an 85% blend of butanol and put it in any type of vehicle that runs on gasoline, no problems whatsoever. It also does not have the corrosive effects of ethanol, like eating into fuel lines and rubber parts and things like that. So it pretty much operates just like standard gasoline. So if we could maybe think in the United States of doing a switch over from butanol, from ethanol to butanol, I think that would be a great thing. This also has an accompanying video with it, too. So anyway, I thought there were some pretty interesting articles, too. I'd also like your opinion on anything you think about any of this stuff, too. What do you think about the uh, switching from ethanol to butanol as a possibility? Um, leave the comments below. Leave observations. Anything like that. So that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.